underground of the year aren't you guys so excited isn't it just good to be in the house of the Lord tonight on this Friday so excited so happy that everyone came tonight um I know everybody's been a little sick and stuff like that you know stuff was going around in the church but just take a time you know, wave at people that you didn't come with. Give somebody a hug. Um, I know we're not in the main, main service, but if you wanted to, go ahead and take a selfie with somebody that's right next to you. Let, let everybody know what we're doing tonight. Let everyone know that Underground is back in session, that we are here for a move of God with the teens and young adults, and how happy we are um, to be in the place. So go ahead and do that for me. I'm going to get out of y'all's hair. Super excited for the word tonight by our very own youth pastor, YPJ. I don't know about y'all, but the last time he was on this stage for that Christmas uh, program, y'all know he, he, y'all know, that's a preacher. That's a preacher for real. But I'm going to get out of y'all's hair. Um, Y'all go ahead and stand for prayer, and we're going further in the service. All right, let's pray, y'all. Father God, we thank you. God, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for what you've done. God, we thank you for the things that you're doing. God, we thank you for everything that you're getting ready to do in our lives. Father God, we thank you that in this year, God, you're going to reveal purpose in our lives. Father God, I thank you that you're accelerating us further than we ever knew that we could be. Father God, I thank you. We bind up any distractions. Father God, anything that is not like you. God, anything that will hinder us, Father God, any person, anything. God, we come up against it now. Father God, we holler your name, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God that provides for us. We holler your name, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord God, our peace giver. God, we thank you <laughs> that you give us peace, Father God, peace that surpasses all understanding. Father God, we thank you that even when we go through, God, you said that you would give us peace. So, Father God, tonight, Lord, I pray that you would just send your spirit, Father God. I pray that you would habitate in this place, Father God. I pray that you would um, show yourself mighty tonight, Father God. I pray right now, God, that you would anoint the man of God, Father God. Anoint his lips, Father God. Anoint the lips of clay, Father God. Speak through him. Speak through his vocal cords, oh God. Father God, do what only you can do. And Father God, when the word is released tonight, Father God, I pray that it falls on good ground, Father God. I pray that everybody would open up their heart to receive the word of God. I pray that everybody would receive it with gladness, Father God. And we thank you for it now. These and many other blessings we pray in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, praise the Lord, everybody. You are my strength. Strength like no other. I just got a revelation. I'm not getting on your nerves. I'm getting on the devil's nerves. Because <laughs> he don't want somebody in here to worship. It's praise. The Bible says he give us a garment of praise. 
So I dare you in this moment before we all lift it up to take off whatever you had on. Before you came in the room, whatever stress you had on, whatever school has done, whatever your relationship has done, and just lift up God in this moment and say, God, you are my strength, not my mom, not my dad, not my job, not my situation, but it reaches me. Sing, you are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. times with our friends our girlfriends but when it comes to worship we're reserved but i believe that this is a generation that will worship god relentlessly that will go beyond if our favorite person doesn't have the mic if it's not our favorite song we'll just worship god because he's god and he's god alone he's the uh, he's the lord of hosts he's the lord of heaven's army so can we just lift up god in this moment i know i keep saying a lot but he's just so worthy breathe the breath of life into us and if he didn't give us this breath we wouldn't even be here today so god we love you Woo. you have no rival you have no equal now and forever god you reign Yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the name above all names. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Christ our King, what a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is, can y'all help me sing that, what a beautiful name, what, what a beautiful, beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is.
release the name. You say the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. When we call Jesus, we call healer. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. He says that he hears the cries of his people. The righteous cry out the and he will deliver. Be the last one, but I don't know. <laughs> to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. To worship you, to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship. generation the people that are that are in this room right now that we will we will cultivate uh, an attitude of worship an apostle worship that will impact our generation because we have so many idols there are so many religions there are so many things that try to take our focus off the beauty of God He's so beautiful. He's so perfect. He's perfect in all his ways. I just thought of another song and I'm going to sing it. I'm going to um, get out your way. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am, it's who I am, you are perfect in all of your ways, you are perfect in all of your ways, perfect in all Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. Inhab inhabitants is another word for habitation. Inhabitation means to live and to dwell. So every time that we lift up our voices, we say something good about him. He comes and he sits. Woo. Woo. And wherever the Bible says wherever his spirit is, there is liberty. <laughs> so whatever you felt bound to coming in as we worship as we sung those songs you were free that's why worship is so important because we, we need his presence you are perfect in all of your ways perfect in all of your ways perfect in all The song said you are perfect in all of your ways. That means in the good times, you're perfect. In the bad times, you're perfect. 
You're perfect when my heart is broken. You're perfect when I'm doing well. You're perfect when my family has gone. You're perfect when I'm all alone. The song says you're perfect in all of your ways because he is a good, good father. You may be seated. You may be seated. Um, I'm so excited to be here on this first underground of the year. Can we give it up for, can we just give it up for Jesus? Y'all can do better than that. Somebody didn't make it to this year. Somebody didn't make it to this day. And Lord, we honor you, Lord. We honor you. Can we give it up to this awesome praise team? <laughs> Phenomenal. So awesome. Thank you so much. The gifts at this church are so abundant. Um, we thank you so much. Um, to our musicians, Trey. Awesome. Phenomenal. Got Omar on the drums. He's a singer himself. Um, we honor everyone who's working um, to make Underground what it is. Um, to Elijah, who's working the media guy, so phenomenal. You know, you know, I want to celebrate my wife who's here today. She turned a red, y'all. She turned a red. <laughs> And we just honor the Lord. I'm, um, I'm not going to be before you long. I mean, honestly, I could have listened to them saying three more songs. I could have li listened to them keep on going. But I do have um, something I want to talk to you guys about. Um, let's go before the throne. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you for this day we've never seen, God. And we thank you for this day we'll never see again. God, we ask asking, God, that you speak through us, God. Let the people be blessed by me and not impressed. Take my tongue and use it as a pen of a ready writer. Let the words of my mouth and the very meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. We honor, we honor our leaders at this phenomenal church. Bishop Jonathan Wood Sr. and our co-pastor, Lady Nicole and our executive pastor in their absence. Okay, so today um, I decided to give a little precursor to what I got for you guys on Valentine's Day. In February, you know, that's love month. And so I'm going to be doing some talking about relationships and stuff. So I decided to kind of give a little piece of that today. Um, today's scripture text is coming from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 11. Second Samuel, chapter number 11. Oh, we got to praise the Lord. There we go. My boy on it, y'all. He on it. I'm going to be reading from the NIV Bible. And it reads as such. In the spring at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Job out with the king's men and the whole Israel army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged the rabbi. But David remained in Jerusalem. That's important. One evening, David got up from his bed, walked around the rooftops of the palace, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, She is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent message to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. The Bible says, now she was purified. Her, she purified herself from her monthly uncleanse. Then she went back home. The woman would conceive, and day, and she would become pregnant. Ladies and gentlemen, for a few moments, I just want to preach to you guys on a simple subject. Check your lights. Check your lights. You may be seated in the presence of God. Check your lights. Everyone, if you have driven a car, has at least once experienced the check engine light coming on in the car. The check engine light is a little orange and yellow light that signifies that the car engine's computer, it's a signal to the car engine's computer that something is possibly wrong. Now, it's important to understand that although the check engine light is on, it does not necessarily mean that there is something wrong with the engine of your car. 
The light could be a minor issue, such as, such as a gas cap loose, or maybe you need to check your battery. However, the light could also signify something much more serious, like your engine misfiring. One could even choose to drive their car, although the light is signifying that something is wrong. Now, as I look out to the audience, some of y'all came here today, your check engine light is on right now. <laughs> the warning light does not prevent you from driving to your destination. Nor would that light, if left unattended, cost you any money in the immediate. However, ignoring the light presents its own dangerous possibilities that can cost you either to have to replace your car or lose your life. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the same way in our spiritual walk with Christ. God often gives us a sign before we suffer serious consequences and a warning before destruction. God always provides a small inclination, hint, or alert that you are possibly going the wrong way. Much like our vehicles, our hearts are the engine that drive us. It is very important to make sure that your engine is working in its proper conditions. But in our anchor text, we're talking about David, and David is one of my favorite biblical characters that we're going to take an introspective look at today. And we're going to look at some of his decisions, some of his choices. We will see how David did not check his engine light. And because of that, he caused his whole family to go in a disarray. The Bible says, the first thing that you will see in 2 Samuel verse number 11, the Bible says, in the spring at the time when the kings went off to war. But where was David? David was the king, right? However, David was on top of the palace, which means David was out of place. You see, David ignored the first warning because he was out of place. The first sign that David was ignoring, that was the first sign that David was ignoring his lights. In the A clause of the text, the Bible says it was a time when kings went off the battle. David ignored his light due to him being in the wrong location at the wrong time. This led to a decision and a choice that would affect and cause David his destiny and many lives. So the first thing you have to understand and why it's important for you to check your light is when you're ignoring your light, sometimes we ignore our light. It's the first sign of being in the wrong location. We choose, oh, I'm sorry. Oftentimes the first sign of ignoring our lights is the location we choose to convene. Oftentimes an indication that you're ignoring your lights is because you're in the wrong places. And think about that. David was a king, which means he could have went everywhere. He, he, could, he had the authority to go anywhere. However, the Bible says it was the season to where kings went out the battle. A lot of times we find ourselves in issues because we're in the wrong, we're in the wrong places at the wrong seasons. There are some seasons where it's imperative to be in a place and if we're honest with ourselves, the time that we found ourselves in the most trouble, if we just be real, it's because we chose to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. There are some relationships and some entanglements. Don't, 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 get this, don't run out the door. I ain't talking to nobody. I'm just talking to who I'm talking to. There are some relationships and some entanglements that we would have never have gotten into if we were not at the wrong place at the wrong time. David was fully aware of where he was supposed to be. Now, watch this. He knew he was supposed to be on the battlefield. However, he chose to be on a roof looking at a naked woman. Okay? Some of us, we're not strong enough to say no. So we can't afford to put ourselves in a predicament. Okay? A lot of times, the Bible says, 
The Bible says, now unto him that is able, right, to keep us from falling. But God can't keep you from falling if you insist on jumping. And a lot of times the issue is, it's not the fact that God can't keep us, it's the fact that we keep on jumping. Because the only time you go to a roof is to commit suicide. Um, we ain't going to go there, though. We ain't going to go there. I got to stay on track. Now, who is Uriah in Bathsheba? Bathsheba was the daughter of a man named Iliam of the house of Esau. Now, there are certain theologians that suggest that she is a co-conspirator in the affair and murder of Uriah. Bathing naked as her husband is on the battlefield, as David was looking out on the roof, they're basically saying, do you think that she did not know that the king was watching her? Ah, oh, yeah, I know. We're going we're gonna to go deeper. This comes from 1 Kings. In the book of 1 Kings, where they get this suggestion from, it's in the book of 1 Kings. She makes a plea to David as David is on his deathbed. She's saying, do you remember you promised me that my son would be king? Now, that's in the book of 1 Kings. And we know who became king was Solomon, which means Solomon skipped the line to become king. Maybe there was a plot she had all along. But let's, let's look a little deeper. Let's look a little deeper. So who was Uriah, though? Let's talk about Uriah. Now, Uriah was a Hittite, okay? He was one of David's generals. He was listed in the book in Samuel 27, I believe. He was one of the mighty men of David. He was very instrumental in David establishing his kingdom. Now, here lies the question. Why would David do such an evil thing to someone who seemed to mean him, to someone who appeared to mean so much to him. Now let's take a look at Uriah for a second. Let's take a look at Uriah. Because David makes a decision that rips his kingdom apart. So what do we know? Uriah is a Hittite. What is a Hittite? The Hittite was a group of people that inhabited the promised land. You remember Moses? Moses, he promised the children of Israel that he would go and deliver them to Canaan land. Well, Canaan land had other inhabitants. Hittites was one of those people. Now, check this out. Uriah is somehow still around after that society was supposed to have been wiped out by Israel. Check this out. Check this out. When the reason why the Bible suggests him and they say Uriah the Hittite, what they're saying is, is Uriah was a foreigner. In other words, he was out of place. Okay? However, he worked right under the king. We're about to go a little deeper. He was a foreigner from another country. When you study First and Second Samuels, you will see that there was a time that David was on the run from Saul, who was trying to kill him, right? And he hid in a cave with 600 men. Uriah was one of these men. So Uriah worked his way up into the ranks. He was a foreigner. He was a man that didn't come from a wealthy family. We already used to suggest that he wasn't a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But somehow, some way, with the help of nobody but God, he established himself right there next to the king. As I look at this text, ladies and gentlemen, could it be possibly that David does what he does? It's because he recognizes the hand that's on Uriah. Because the same hand that was on Uriah is the same hand that's on him. What does the name Uriah mean? The, main, the name Uriah, it means flame of God. Or in other words, my light is God. Now, I'm not trying to start no mess. But I am saying that David possibly knew after he messed up, there was somebody else that had his hand that God loved just as he loved David. 
And David does the same thing to Uriah that Saul did to him. The only difference is, is that God allowed Uriah to die and then protect him like he protected David. Think about it. Saul, when David is anointed king because Saul messes up, what does Saul do? He's trying to protect his kingdom. He takes a spear and he lunges it at David. David messes up. What does he do? He kills the man and marries his wife. It is crazy. But still, YP, what does that have to do with checking my light? Because David knew better. He was well aware of everything that he was doing. Verses number 11, 6 and through 10. Put that up for me. So David sent word to Job, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Job sent to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Job was. The soldier was, the soldier were, and how was the war going? Verse 8. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace in a gift that was sent from the king. Now that statement right there, wash your feet, right? So what David is telling him, he's telling him, go home, get clean, and get busy with your wife. Because at this moment, David already got Bathsheba pregnant. But because of his sin, he's now trying to cover it up. But let's watch what Uriah does, verse number nine. But Uriah slept at the entry to the palace with all the master's servants. His king gives him an order. Go to your wife. Have sex with her. Because he's trying to cover what he did. Uriah is so honorable. He trusts God so much. that He's like, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to. He sits, he lays down outside with the soldiers. Verse number 10. David was told, when David was told what Uriah, Uriah did not go home, he asked Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Verse 11. Right. The ark of Israel is in Judah. Are you, and it's staying in the tent. And my commander, Job, my Lord, in an open country. Verse 12. How could I go to my house, eat, drink, make love to my wife, and surely you live, I would not do such a thing. Why is Uriah saying this? Because all soldiers had to take a vow. When they were in battle, they could not have sex with them. They could not have sex. They, his king is giving him an order, right? Uriah is basically being so honorable to God, and he is refusing because he's understanding that I cannot betray my king, even if it means um, I cannot betray my king, even if my king has given me a direct order. Right? Are y'all with me? All right. So, David is trying to cover up his sins by having Uriah sleep with his wife. David has clearly been driving in his car as the light's been going off telling him that something's wrong with his heart, but he's not paying it no attention. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of times in our life that before we get to a place of doing something we have no business doing, God has oftentimes got that light going off. It's us that choose to ignore it. And we keep on driving because the car is still taking us to our destination. But David is showing us that you can be a king and still be wrong. You can be anointed and still be a failure. So the second sign of ignoring the light is when you ignore accountability. You know that you're ignoring the light when you don't want accountability. You know that you're ignoring the light when somebody is trying to hold you accountable, but you're choosing not to listen. Because David is taking no accountability up to this point for what he's done. He's still trying to cover it up. But let's see. At this moment, David has not yet repented. And he's trying to cover his sins. He attempts to cover his sins. But God already knows. 
True restoration can only happen when true accountability takes place. That means that at a certain point, you have to stop playing the victim. Because the truth is, a lot of us wouldn't be in the mess that we got in if we didn't do something first. Okay. Now what happens next is something that I think that's, is, I don't know if it's gangster or just downright evil. Because um, David does something so questionable. Um, after a third time of not getting Uriah to go sleep with his wife, because Uriah is being honorable to David, David then gives him another command. He gives him a letter carrying his own death certificate. Let's go to the text. Get me... Alrighty. Verses... Right there in verse number... Yeah. Verse number 13. And David, at his invitation, he ate and he drunk. And David made him drunk. David now has made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on the mat amongst his master's servants. Again now, David's trying to get him a drunk so he is sin. Uriah still won't do it. Verse 14. Verse 14. Now, I'll tell you what happens. You get it, brother. Verse 14. So what happens next? <laughs> Alright. What happens next is this. So the next day when David finds out that Uriah still did not go sleep with his wife, he gives him a letter to send to the general who was Job. And that letter was to send Uriah into the thickest side of the battle. Because David knew at this point that Uriah was so honorable that he would not have opened the letter. Again, and even at the same time, when Uriah gets the order, he knows that his king is trying to kill him. But he is so honorable, so committed to a God that ain't even his God. He was Remember, he was a Hittite. He wasn't raised as an Israelite. He's so committed and honorable to God, he chooses to go and die anyway because of his king's honor, his king's words. And the Bible says the way that it happened, they were laying siege on the, on the kingdom, right? And Uriah goes to the thickest side of the battle. But instead of fighting with him, all the men retreat. But Uriah doesn't run. He stays right there and he dies for his king. The same king that took his wife and got her pregnant. And you know what David did? David didn't think about him again and went and married his wife. Ah, man. But God sent the prophet. Because the thing that we don't realize, even if you think that you're getting away with what you're doing, God always sees. And God always knows. So God sends the prophet Nathan to him, and Nathan gives him a, par a parable. And David begins to react a particular way, and Nathan reveals to him that you're that bad person. The person that you said should be put to death is you. And Nathan exposes David, but not to everybody. We're in chapter 12, verse 13, verse 11, chapter 13. We're going to get this right, Elijah. This is my bad. Then David said, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. The third sign. Well, thank you. But because of doing this, you have shown utter contempt to the Lord. Your son that's going to be born will die. Verse 15. You got it? Oh, man, my bad. Okay. All right. So he tells him that he's going to die now. The baby that they were just had born, right? And also, he also tells him that now blood and calamity will be on your household. Now, that's major, right? That's major. Because David is the king. He's still anointed. He still has the Lord on his side. 
But now calamity is going against his house. The word calamity means disaster. And it says his household, which means his children and children's children. So he keeps God's anointing, but he loses his purpose. What does that mean? Me and I want to talk to you for a second. You can make decisions in your life that not just affect you, but it affects your household. And it affects people that David's one decision, it not only affected him, but it killed soldiers on the battlefield. And it killed his children. Because the Bible said the sword is against your children now. In other words, what happens when you ignore your light? When you ignore the light, when you ignore your light, it brings your sin into the light. When you ignore your light, it brings exposure. And I ain't got to talk about that right now because you see it happening in the body of Christ. When you ignore the light, it brings your sin into the light eventually. When you ignore the problem, the problem grows to a point to where you can't keep it a secret. You can choose to ignore the fact that your tire is running low and you can possibly put air in it instead of fixing it. The leak does not prevent the, this leak does not prevent the car from driving. The vehicle can still operate even with a slow leak in the tire. Here's my question. Have you been operating with a slow leak? Have you been operating knowing that your lights have been going off? But have you been still coming to church and dancing over your empty tires? Your battery that needs to be replaced. David still ran his kingdom despite the leaps in his decisions. The leaps in his struggles with his lust. The leaks with his integrity. We shout and we run around the church, but that does not address the issue. It is the same equivalent to knowing that something is wrong with your car, but choosing not to address it. So the fourth thing that happens when you ignore your light, it produces a lifestyle of sin. And sin produces death. Because here's the thing. It doesn't matter if you have a slow leak, a small poke in your tire, or a hole in it. The end result is a flat tire. And if you're operating with a flat tire, it leads to disaster. And a lot of us, we choose not to check our lights because maybe it's inconvenient to check the light. Maybe it's just easier to go to the gas station and just put a little air in it, pay $2 and not worry about it instead of paying the $100 to get your tire fixed. But what you don't realize is is that every time that you don't check your light and every time that you ignore your light, you're playing Russian roulette with your destiny. What is Russian roulette? That's a game where you take a revolver gun, put one bullet in it, and you spin it, and you pull the trigger. And every time that you sin, knowing willing and ignore the warnings that's what you're doing with your destiny in your life you're paying you're playing Russian roulette with your future and I hope that this story that I talked today illustrated that it doesn't matter who you are doesn't matter how good you can sing how good you can preach how awesome you can pray that your decisions and that your choices You have to face them eventually. David never faced his choices. He never did. What you will find out what happened after the test, the very next chapter, we see the calamity coming to his household. He had a son named Abnon who desired to have sex with his sister Tamar. And as a result of that, he ended up raping her. He rapes her. He rapes her, and then he casts her to the side. Well, she had an older brother. When that older brother heard what happened, the Bible says he was furious, but he said nothing to David because he stood back to watch to see what his daddy would do. And his daddy was angry, but he chose not to do anything because his daddy remembered what he did to Uriah. 
Emotions don't change you. Only God can. What happens next is very, very pivotal because David, once again, is ignoring his likes. He chooses not to do anything to Amnon. So what does Absalom do? He takes things into his own account. He murders his brother. The Bible says that years later, he travels away and he ends up coming back to Jerusalem. David's still messing up. Instead of addressing Absalom, the Bible says for two years, he ignored him. For two years, he didn't say anything to his son. And his son allowed hatred, anger, and venom to poison his heart. And what happened next was something that's very, very interesting, but you can really see coming when you read the text. Absalom was able to take the whole kingdom away from his daddy. Now, this was the one that God had anointed, but because of his decision, his choices, he lost his mantle. What am I saying? I'm saying that regardless of who you are, if you don't make better decisions, if you don't make better choices, you will lose your mantle. You'll still be anointed. But David has just proven how you can be an anointed failure. That I can still love and serve the Lord and still be empty. I can still love and serve the Lord, but still have no peace. I can still love and serve the Lord, but my family is destroyed. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to make a conscious and an effort decision that we're going to make better decisions and that we're going to check our lights. The Bible says, let your light so shine that you may see, that others may see their good works. There's a story that Jesus, and I'm closing, I'm ending it, that the, you had the ten virgins with their lights, right? And then five was foolish and five was wise. And the five that was wise, they took extra oil to keep their lights going. And the five that was um, foolish, they did not. And what happened, eventually, the light goes out. YP, what are you saying? I'm saying that if you do not check the time to check your light, eventually your light goes out. But the problem, I'm sorry, man. But the problem, when your light goes out, there are some people who don't get the opportunity to just replace their car because they chose not to take their light. And because of that, it took their lives. So everybody's standing. One of the things that God gave me for this year was about focus and focusing on, you know, just having a pure heart. If you've been on the prayer calls, you've been hearing Bishop, he's been preaching about um, having pure heart and pure motives and how um, that's the one thing that, in my opinion, that's the, that's the key to everything, really, is having a, a pure heart and pure emotions. And that's one of the things that David said. We'll see in the Psalms when he was getting his life together, he, he was praying prayers of God, you know, creating me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. Wash me with hyssop. Why? Because David understood that at some point I got off track. At some point, I got so caught up in the lights and I got so caught up in being a king that I forgot that my first ministry is to be to lead by example. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes it's a dangerous thing when I hold my position more in abundance than I reverence my God. Because at the end of the day, it's not about your position. It's all about Jesus. So right where you are, maybe you've been that person that knowing that you need to check your lights. And maybe you've ignored the signs. You've ignored the warnings. And I don't know what your light is that you need to check. Maybe it's a light of pornography that you've been slipping up back in. Maybe it's a light of fornication. Maybe it's a light of a bad attitude. Maybe it's a light of unforgiveness that you won't check because you want them to apologize first. But the problem is you're supposed to be the saved one. 
God ain't watching them, he's watching you. So my brother Malachi is gonna... Oh, you on the drum? You good, you good, you good, you good, you good, you good. I'm sorry. So right now, we're gonna pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for every individual in this room, God. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness for the times you let the light go off and we chose to ignore it. God, we ask for forgiveness that every time we heard the beat when we opened up the doors of our heart and we chose to keep on going. Lord, we ask your forgiveness that we chose to get up here and worship you with a bad heart. We chose to serve you knowing that we were not right. We chose to give you praise knowing that our hearts were so far from you. Lord, we ask your forgiveness. God, we ask that right now that you begin to do maintenance on us, Lord. From the crown of our heads down to the sole of our feet. God, we ask that you do maintenance on our minds, God. That you do maintenance on our hearts, God. That you give us insight to let our God help us to see what you see when you look at us. Father, I pray for that broken spirit. I pray for that broken heart that is still struggling with abandonment issues. God, we don't want the light to keep going and we don't want to ignore it so much and so to now we're on the, on the side of the road and we're all alone. So God, we ask God that you come into our lives right now and we repent to you, Jesus. We repent to you, God. We ask God that you create in us a clean heart just as you did as David. Don't take your spirit, don't take your dunamis away from us, God. Don't take your power, Lord. Because God, we need your power, Lord. We need you. Without your power, we can't walk. Without your power, we can't talk. God, it is your power that gives me the energy and the, the wisdom to even love, God, because I can't even love without you, Lord. So God, we ask God and we repent to you right now, Father. Clean us, God. Purge us, God. Make us new. If it's anybody that we've hurt along our journeys, God, if it's anybody that we've hurt along our processes, God, we ask that we ask that you forgive us, Lord. God, forgive us for the Uriahs in our life. Forgive us for the Bathsheba's in our life, God, that we've neglected, that we pushed to the side, that we've assassinated silently. And God, we pray, God, that you be everything to us that we need you to be. Help us to walk right. Help us to talk right. And Lord, we forever give your name the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. No, I'll say a mini. You want to say something? Sing something. Okay. Um, this this will conclude uh, this underground. But I do feel God, though. I do feel God in the room. I feel God shifting something. Mm. Well, this will conclude. I'm going to give a benediction so you can go home if you want. So, Father God, we ask, God, that you touch us, God, as we give us traveling mercies, give us traveling grace, God, that you drive our cars for us, Lord. And, God, if any one of us got a light going on in our car, God, we ask, God, that you give us the wisdom and the ability and the mind to get it fixed. Father, we will forever give you the praise and the honor and all the glory. And it's your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.